My name is Hisham, and today I'm going to be presenting our work where we perform distributed pre-training of transformers for diverse latent representations of small molecules. In this work, we take an aggregate of publicly available SMILES datasets from GDB13, Zinc15, PubChem, as well as Campbell. We canonicalize each string in this dataset and then train a sentence piece model on this dataset. This model splits the spiral string into tokens in a data-driven manner. As a result, we end up with over 1.2 billion unique smiles, which we perform distributed mass language modeling training on. This results in our model MF BERT. We take the results of this model, which are contextual embeddings for every token, and we use these to generate a molecular fingerprint. This fingerprint can then be used for similarity screening or as input for machine learning models. Our model can also be fine tuned on smaller datasets to generate more targeted contextual embeddings. The architecture is based on the Roberta architecture with 12 attention heads and 12 encoder layers. We also explore additional architectures such as a Siamese MFBERT where we clone the MFBERT network and combine two fingerprints of the same molecule but with different spirals permutations. If you'd like to know more about our work, please check our poster, P01. Thanks for listening. Autoencoders are one of the most commonly used neural network architectures for the NOVA design. Their latent representations are often used to train machine learning methods that generate compounds with desired properties. However, so far reported SMILES-based and GRAB-based autoencoders generate latent vectors that retain information about order of atoms. Thus, two similar structures can be very far apart in the latent space. It may affect predictions of physical chemical properties based on the latent vectors. In this work, we have developed a new order-independent graph-based autoencoder architecture. Its main feature is an encoder that uses only commutative operations to transform molecular graph into a latent vector. The latent vectors of new autoencoder were benchmarked against latent vectors of SMILES-based and GRAB-based autoencoders, as well as ECFP fingerprints and EZDA fragment descriptors on quantitative structure activity relationship task. For this purpose, 578 subsets containing ligands tested against particular biological targets were extracted from the Campbell database version 27. Then all molecular representations were fed to a multilayer perceptron model. The results shows that classification model based on the latent vectors of order independent architecture performs similarly to those based on uh, molecular uh, descriptors and outperforms those based on the latent vectors of order-dependent architectures. Thank you for your attention, and I'm ready to answer all of your questions. Database augmentation is an important part of training a prediction model, which mitigates such problems as small database, overfitting, and poor generalizability. Augmentation is commonly used in image recognition, in natural language, and signal processing. However, protein database augmentation has not been fully studied. In this work, we investigate the application of augmentations to a protein deleteriousness prediction upon point mutations. We augment our curated dataset by identifying top three unique and frequent mutations from the deleterious class and introducing the mutation to a benign class protein to increase the deleterious class samples and vice versa. This way, we make an assumption that leucine to histidine substitution is characteristic for the deleterious class, as it can only be found in the deleterious class nine times over the data set. Using this assumption, we find leucine in benign proteins and substitute them for histidine 
and change its label to deleterious to generate a new sample that belongs to the deleterious class. Our database consisted of over 3,000 benign and over 1,500 deleterious point mutations. For each entry, we had corresponding PDB crystal structures. We used baseline MCSM descriptors to extract the protein environment and sequence-based descriptors to compare the results. We trained the XGBoost model with 400 trees and five-fold cross-validation as the training data was tabular. Sequence-based descriptors demonstrated a slight increase in area and the curve metrics after augmentations. However, the difference between structures and descriptors after augmentations was significant. Thank you for your attention. Don't hesitate to reach me out at the conference. Hi, my name is Amir from Karolinska Institute, and I'll be presenting explainable polypharmacy side effect prediction with Siamese graph convolutional neural networks. This work has utilized graph neural nets and developed a representation learning framework capable of accurately and interpretably predicting the polypharmacy side effect of any given drug combination. To achieve this, first, we establish the protein side effect association by embedding them as node features of the human protein-protein interaction network. By assuming that the drug can reach the entire PPI network, and then their respective binding affinity towards each protein was calculated. Applying cutoff filtering significantly reduces the number of possible interactions. The remaining proteins are considered to be associated with recorded side effect of the drug in the CIDR database. Enrichment of this data for all available drugs will result in establishment of the Protein Side Effect Association or PSA. Next for each drug, we extract its PSA subgraph, which contains the proteins with a high binding affinity towards corresponding drug. These subgraphs then will be used in pairs as the input of the model. The Siamese graph convolutional neural networks will predict the individual side effect, and then by mean aggregation. The model predicts the probability of occurrence of each 964 adverse side effect. The model was trained using the two sides dataset, and obtains 91.43% accuracy with an external dataset containing 10,000 unique drug combinations. The pipeline is scalable and fully automated. It only requires smiles of the drugs for the prediction. Also, since the inputs are protein-protein interactions, the predictions can be affiliated to the proteins that may be causing a particular side effect, despite the model achieving high accuracy and beating the state-of-the-art ML models. It has inferior average precision and F1 score. The reason is the intrinsic sparsity and imbalance of the data. Siamese neural nets are difficult to optimize. The model also suffers from the absence of regularization. If you are interested in this work, please reach out or visit us at Poster5. Greetings. My name is José Caetano, and along with Filipe Teixeira and Natalia Cordeiro, we present our work, Machine Learning Algorithm Design for the Prediction of Isodesmic Reaction Entropy of Smaller Organic Molecules. We are scientists at the LIK Verde Quint, Faculty of Sciences at the University of Porto, Portugal. Machine learning algorithms are gaining momentum as novel tools for industrial manufacturing development. The overlap of chemical catalysis and data science has proven to be a valuable asset in handling large data sets towards the understanding and prediction of the events occurring at the chemical space. With these algorithms, properties of a chemical species involved can be actually obtained, opening up new possibilities to improve quantitative catalytic reaction models. By avoiding time-consuming processes, diminishing overall computational cost and experimental trials, it is possible to embolden chemists and industries with a predictive model that eases reaction conditions aiming at system sustainability and efficiency. In this communication, we present our framework for setting up machine learning models able to estimate isodesmic reaction entropy at room temperature involving small organic molecules. The datasets involve experimental data from the predictive values available at the literature. We outline the advances of our low-cost in-house framework on the development of molecular descriptors used as inputs for the machine learning algorithm. The model's performance was evaluated comparing published experimental data with the obtained entropy values, asserting the pertinence of their chosen machine learning algorithms. Preliminary results show an estimated error percentage around 1% giving a comprehensive database of isodesmic reactions, 
thus opening up new possibilities for using machine learning to estimate thermodynamic properties. Thank you for your time. Hello everyone, my name is Lionel Collian. I'm working at Tevotech in Toulouse in France, and I propose you to visit my poster P09 about application of Bayesian optimization in joint discovery. I will explain you what is Bayesian optimization and how we can apply it to optimize small chemical compounds. To apply Bayesian optimization on chemical structures, we need to convert structures in molecular descriptors, leading very rapidly to the problem of optimization in a high dimensional space. In the poster, I explain how we tackle this challenge through the use of a latent space representation coming from a variational autoencoder. Then, I describe our two main applications of Bayesian optimization in our drug design project. The first application incorporates Bayesian optimization in an active learning loop. The second application uses Bayesian optimization to generate new molecular entities optimized towards the project objective. So if you want to understand more Bayesian optimization, please come visit my poster P09. Thank you. Hello everybody, I'm Marcus Dablander, a DPhil student from the University of Oxford, and I'm going to talk about joint research with Jerry Hanser from Larsa Limited and Renaud Lambiot and Garrett Morris from the University of Oxford. Our work is concerned with the prediction of activity cliffs in chemical space. Activity cliffs are pairs of molecular compounds which only differ by a small structural transformation at a specific site, but show a large potency difference of at least two orders of magnitude against a given pharmacological target. Activity cliffs are of crucial importance in drug discovery due to their role in structural compound optimization, the elucidation of structure activity relationships, and as roadblocks for QSR prediction models. Our key idea for the prediction of activity cliffs is to use a Siamese twin neural network that can extract features from unordered pairs of inputs in a natural and symmetric manner. Our model can be seamlessly integrated with standard molecular representation techniques such as graph neural networks or molecular fingerprints. To test our method, we conduct numerical experiments for the prediction of activity cliffs in a dataset of blood coagulation factor 10A inhibitors. We show that both a graph-based and a fingerprint-based version of our method achieve strong predictive performance and outcompete a related baseline model. In summary, we can conclude that Siamese neural networks are highly suitable models for activity cliff prediction. They are naturally adapted to process pairs of inputs in a symmetric manner, they can be easily combined with standard molecular representations, and they show strong predictive performance. Furthermore, we observe in our experiments that molecular fingerprints beat graph neural networks in our application, which calls for further research into graph-based molecular representation learning. Thank you very much for your attention. Recently, Science featured a novel application of machine learning for predicting reaction yield percentage using nothing more than computationally derived descriptor data. This work demonstrated exceptional results with respect to a regression task predictive of yield percentage. We decided to take a deeper dive into this data to better understand and characterize the predictive power of ensemble tree models. Yield is re-encoded for binary classification and model using XGBoost. And predictive results were exceptional. Exceptional predictive power suggests a valid predictive substructure. Here we confirm a Pareto-like attribution curve, whereby less than 20% of features drive 80% of model output. However, it's crucial to note that the remaining 80% of features still contribute to predictive output in the context of machine learning. So here we develop a straightforward way to characterize feature attribution in a context we're all familiar with, linear models. So three diagnostic metrics align to paint a clear picture with respect to the significance of each feature, as well as multicollinearity and latent interaction effects. In the linear modeling context, issues concerning significance due to multicollinearity limit the degree to which features with more nuanced effects can contribute to model output. Referring back to the XGBoost output graph, we find such features assigned to the bottom left quadrant, Q3. On its own, XGBoost does not allow for a more detailed exploration of the relationship between features and predictive objective. Now, Shapely Additive Explanations is an AI-driven deductive heuristic that uses the XGBoost model to impute the statistical impact of the original data with respect to each case. SHAP encodes the entire probabilistic space captured within the XGBoost model. This synthetic data is dimensionally identical to the original data, but IID and homogeneous with respect to unit, scale, and interpretation. So here we see that SHAP obviates the multicollinearity issues allowing for high, a high-power linear model. 
So indeed, the Shap Power Linear Model actually beats out the Random Forest Model at features at sizes less than 10. However, things quickly change with a white horse. So machine learning has been widely successful across many fields. However, the roots of its success has been largely misunderstood. Here we show the degree to which data creation efforts, even those powered by machine learning and AI, can minimize the performance delta between machine learning and traditional models. So taken together, this all suggests that features that do not perform well with respect to cover and frequency are likely to benefit from additional curation efforts. Thank you very much. So hello everyone, my name is Anne Goto and my poster is regarding learning from the active site, de novo drug design by combining available reagents, reactions and docking in deep reinforcement learning. So the motivation behind this work is to design de novo molecules using reinforcement learning to tackle the multi-objective optimization problem in drug discovery. And our work is based on multi-QM, um, which is an application of GP learning, which optimizes for a reward function, including QED and penalized log P. And more DQN performs three actions, including atom bond addition and bond removal to generate new compounds, but compound synthetic accessibility are not guaranteed. So we have used commercially available reagents from reactors and most commonly used reactions in medicinal chemistry from roughly et al. to propose new compounds. And Rx and DQN is a reaction-based DQ learning, and Rx and more DQN is a hybrid DQ learning between more DQN and Rx and DQN, which we have developed. And based on the case study from 10 ligand pairs from the more set, it was found that our methods have improved synthetic accessibility as well as chemical space coverage. Um, but comparing our methods against published methods, it was found that our methods performed as well or better as compared to other state-of-the-art techniques and generated compounds which are 100% chemically valid. And based on the results from tiny motor similarity, it was found that our method was capable of regenerating the starting compound with a score of 1 and generated compounds which are structurally similar with a score greater than 0.85. And we have further extended these methods by incorporating order.vena and based on the case study using one of the covalently attached COVID moonshot ligands, it was found that our method was capable of exploring active site in 3D. So if you're interested in finding out more about this exciting project to design new small molecules, please drop by to my poster, P13. Thank you for listening. Hello, my name is Tom Hadfield. I'm a doctoral student in the Oxford Protein Informatics Group. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we've been doing in computational fragment elaboration. So briefly, elaborating a fragment to improve its binding affinity is expensive and time consuming. And as a result, there's been lots of recent work in looking at using deep generative models to automate this process somewhat. However, existing models for fragment elaboration either don't use any information about the target at all, or they do so implicitly by providing a list of known actives to the model. And this hinders its applicability in cases where you're working with a novel target and there are no known actives to be used. Our model extracts information directly from the protein by calculating fragment hotspot maps, which identify regions that make a disproportionately large contribution to binding affinity. Our generative model then makes elaborations such that matching pharmacores are placed within the, bind the hotspot regions. We benchmarked our model on a test set constructed from the CASF 2016 set and compared it to two recently published benchmarks, one a deep learning based generative model and another a database based approach. We found that on average, our model was able to generate elaborations that were more ligand efficient than the elaborations produced by the benchmarks, illustrating the benefit of including structural information into the generative process. If you'd like to find out more about the work we've been doing, please come and talk to me at uh, our poster session. I'm poster number 14, and I hope you enjoy the conference. Our poster, we propose the model composed of a peak detection DNN coupled with a GAN for background reconstruction. The DNN model is efficient at detecting one or two peaks at most. The detected peaks can then be isolated and removed from the signal, which can then be passed to the GAN. The GAN reconstructs the area with plausible background. The signal can then be fed to the DNN again so that any remaining peaks can be detected. In the end, what we are left with is a collection of peaks and a reconstructed background. The GAN is trained on artificial data, which we prepared ourselves. To create the training data set for the GAN, the signals containing different number of peaks were generated, and subsequently, holes of various sizes were made to the data. These holes are really sections of the signal that have been set to negative 0.1. The GAN generator then fills this area with a possible background, while maintaining the rest of the signal intact. The GAN model we use is a Wasserstein GAN with a gradient penalty. This prevents the rapid convergence that the Druze combinator would have otherwise, and it keeps the both uh, the generator and the critic balanced. Both DNN and GAN have begun training and testing on real data, 
And while the preliminary results are promising, there is still room for performance improvement for both models. Real-world data, we use two types of spectroscopic measurements, namely surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy and high-performance liquid chromatography Raman. SERS data was obtained through two different techniques, substrate-based and colloidal-based. Substrate was kindly provided by our collaborators at National Taiwan University. Colloids were prepared using method described by Leopold and Lendl with the help of Applied Chem Department at NYCU. HPLC data was also acquired with the help of Applied Chem Department at NYCU. If you are interested in details, make sure to check poster 15. I am Jules Legui, I'm a PhD student in computer science. I'm working on de novo molecular generation problems. It consists in automatically searching for molecules that satisfy your desired property. More specifically, I work on problems in the domain of molecular materials for which the evaluation of the properties depends on costly quantum mechanics computations. This cost is actually an obstacle to the exploration of the chemical space. The evaluation can be accelerated by, by predicting the properties using machine learning models. However, these models may fail to correctly evaluate molecules that are very different from their learning examples, which may actually limit their ability to discover new materials. Here, we propose an optimization method that is based on a machine learning model, the surrogate function here, and that estimates the values of the property to be optimized. It is used to select promising molecules that will be evaluated by quantum mechanics here. At each step, these new results are inserted in the training dataset. So, the surrogate is trained again with molecules that are more and more relevant for the property. New candidate molecules are obtained at each step by using an evolutionary algorithm to maximize the expected improvement of the surrogate function. This is very similar to Bayesian optimization, but the evolutionary algorithm allows us to generate solution in the whole chemical space. We evaluate our method on the maximization of the HOMO energy. We show that it can find high scoring molecules using less call to the costly property than a purely evolutionary approach. To conclude, our approach based on a surrogate model that is learned iteratively can limit the evaluations and thus the optimization time for a costly property. I'm here to talk about the use of machine learning for organic synthesis in COVID moonshot. Machine learning for organic synthesis has been extensively studied computationally. However, experimentally, it has only been evaluated at a small scale involving only tens to hundreds of reactions at most. It has not yet been stress tested in a real world drug discovery scenario. This is exactly what was done in COVID moonshot, which is a large campaign to search for a COVID-19 antiviral. In this project, proposed drug candidates were made completely following machine learning designed synthesis routes. Over the past year, this has added up to over 2,400 compounds successfully made starting from purchasable building blocks. This is a huge number of compounds involving a large amount of resources. The successful synthesis of all of these together with the good correlation between the actual time taken to synthesize these molecules with the predicted complexity, demonstrate that ML synthesis planning is mature enough to be successfully deployed in a real world campaign. Although this shows reaction prediction models are obviously making correct predictions, are they doing so for the right reason? Branching out from this, we developed a novel framework for interpreting whether or not reaction prediction models make sense in their predictions. Using this framework, combined with careful experiments on reaction selectivity, we show that reaction prediction models are quite vulnerable to dataset bias, and that the standard benchmark USPTO contains these biases as well. Following from this, we proposed a more rigorous train test split to accurately measure the performance of reaction prediction models. Thank you. Hello, everyone, and thanks for joining me. My name is Mark. I'm a PhD student at the University of Oxford in Garrett Morris's group, and we're looking at graph neural networks for binding affinity prediction and how much structural information really is necessary to build good models. The aim of the project is, on the one hand, to look into that relationship and doing different tests on different levels of structural information. 
On the other hand, we're really interested in COVID-19 mPro as well. So we've built a curated data set of all the main protease inhibitors for all the different coronavirus families we could get our hands on into one big data set that we use for training and testing to find good inhibitors. For the methods, uh, our GraphMo networks ligand-based are in a two-branch setup inspired by GraphDTA, where the protein side is encoded as a 1D sequence, so no structural information, 3D information required. We're benchmarking those models against the sign method, which is the best structure-based method we could find tested on PDB bind. For the feature sets, uh, as I said, ligand-based features for graphs, but also we came up with a new contact-based graph that we call ECIG that is heavily inspired by the extended connectivity interaction features, ECIF fingerprints. On the results end, the PDB bind refined set 2016 data is shown on the left. The best model is a bagged model between ECFP fingerprints and our ECIG graphs uh, with a 0.81 Pearson correlation coefficient. And most interestingly, it does not lose performance when testing it on doc structures, which is normally the biggest disadvantage of structure-based methods is that they really fall off when looking at docked poses. For the MPRO model, unfortunately, we're losing uh, performance in comparison. And the ECIG models are absolutely terrible, as you can see, but we have some decent models, for example, the GATNET model. Caveat here being that we actually haven't hyperparameter tuned those models against the MPRO data set yet. Those are PDB bind tuned models, and this is a work in progress. So hopefully I can come back to you in a few months time or a few weeks time with a, a full uh, set of models tuned for MPRO. Yeah, if those results are interesting to you, you want to talk about data sets or MPRO, please find me at poster19. Thank you. Hello, my name is Bohdan Pinkowski. I am R&D project manager at Elizaphil. I am going to present our work towards autonomous microfactory, AI and flow chemistry integration. Our objective is autonomous production units. Thereby we leverage two core technologies, artificial intelligence and flow chemistry. This will give us benefits of continuity of production, highly controllable processes resulting in high quality products, industrial risk mitigation, reduced environmental impact. We have built a proof-of-concept microfactory for isoamyl acetate synthesis. We have 3D printed reactors and purification line. We have provided real-time monitoring and remote control. To study autonomous pilot feasibility, we use deep reinforcement learning. The agent interacts with the environment and it receives rewards for every action. Our AI agent is able to observe product conversion while controlling flow rate and reactor temperature. We have built an environment which is a digital twin based on laboratory experiments. Now, our agent receives no explicit instruction. It has to figure out the best strategy on its own. First, we fix the desired thermostat temperature and flow rate. There is no adaptive control. Therefore, as the reactor cools down, the reaction conversion also drops. Next, we inspect how adaptive agent responds to the change in environment. When reactor cools down, it adapts the flow rate and the conversion remains intact. We have also verified that the agent is extremely robust to the sensor noise. We conclude that the approach is robust to environmental changes and to sensor noise. Interestingly, the agent learns to anticipate the future conversion outcome with respect to the residence time. We have a single algorithm to gather all sensor inputs to react in real time. Our results suggest a reliable ground for the physical implementation. Hi, my name is Jenka and I'm a PhD student at the University of Edinburgh at the group of Julian Michel. This poster displays our ongoing work on optimal network generation for free energy perturbation, or FEP in short. FEP space, as seen in figure three, was constructed to serve as a model training set to represent all realistically possible molecular transformations in FEP. The reliability in standard error of the mean, or SEM, across quintuplicate FEP simulations correlates well to its original ligands in the bound phase. See figure four. We aim to open source this data set for the community to use and drive the field forward. Additionally, we've constructed a twin neural network approach, see figure five, that has dual inputs, one for each ligand member of a given perturbation. Through a transfer learning approach, we're able to predict FEP reliability and are able to feed this into perturbation network generator algorithms. Although this is very much an ongoing work, we expect to outperform state-of-the-art network generation methods using our FEP reliability predictors. If you're at all interested, please do come see me at Poster 23. I'm looking forward to discussing this work further. The rules of catalysis are elusive. Understanding what makes a catalyst work for a particular reaction is a non-trivial task. 
an increasingly important one as you try to access more and more complicated molecules, for example in medicinal chemistry, materials chemistry or in natural product synthesis. Whilst it's possible to calculate a wealth of information about catalysts and substrates computationally, linking this data to experimental results is challenging. However, this is essential when attempting to predict which catalyst to use for any given reaction. Much of the work here uses DFT calculated data condensed using principal component analysis. This enables a selection of important chemical properties to be represented on a simple map. This map can be used to guide selection of catalysts and substrates. In addition to these ligand and substrate maps, which provide general information, specific reactions can be considered. In this case, oxidative addition has been explored in great detail using a variety of ligands and substrates. In my research so far, I've been looking at caged phosphines. These molecules have really interesting stereoelectronic properties and are relatively bench stable, making them attractive for catalysis. You can see some of the caged phosphine ligands I have added to the map in green and navy. Also highlighted in this map are some fluorophosphite ligands. The circled ligands are highly electronegative, even more so than PF3. This shows how the map can be navigated to select ligands with desirable or unusual properties. Now we have some computational data about these ligands, I'm keen to use these molecules for catalysis and determine the trends between computational and experimental results possibly identifying some of the rules which are at play. If you want to see more details about the work featured here, please come and see my poster. Thank you. Hi, I'm Srijit and I'm excited to share my research on representing cell morphology readouts in grid form to leverage neighborhood feature correlations. The cell painting data set is an unbiased systems biology measurement of various cell statistics across six different stains, five channels and eight constituent organelles. The problem here, however, is that the numerical features are highly correlated and difficult to interpret biologically. Here, we predict cell health readouts, where a specific reagent is used to measure various aspects of cell health, including proliferation, mitosis, DNA damage, etc. We generate a TSND visualization of the features across each perturbation, meaning each point on this TSND map represents a feature. This clustering therefore represents features having similar effect across all perturbations. The jonker volganet algorithm is used to fit these results into a rectangular grid by an optimizing of a cost matrix. These matrices are then trained using efficient net B0 architecture. Using gradient-based localization, we generate a coarse localization map representing regions of importance in these images for each true positive sample in the test set. In results, we observe a mean 14% improvement in balanced accuracy in 19 out of 70 cell health assays, particularly in ones related to mechanisms of cell death. Further, we see that similar regions, similar endpoints such as those related to DNA damage show similar regions of importance, particularly in intensity of DNA in cytoplasm channels. These features could show or signify DNA fragmentation, for example. In future, we will try to work with larger data sets to explore new perturbation space, particularly as there are no chemical structural models to predict effects of genetic perturbations. We will try to understand regions of this morphology space to better understand what they signify biologically and try to predict mechanism of action of compounds using cell painting screens. Thank you. Hello, my name is Gregor Sim, and today I would like to talk about our work on reinforcement learning for molecular design guided by quantum chemistry. The overarching goal of this line of work is to accelerate the search for novel molecular structures with machine learning. Currently, so-called generative models in chemistry suffer from the following two key limitations. First, they are based on graph and string representations of molecules. As a result, they lack 3D information that is the position of atoms in space and can only generate single organic molecules. Inorganic systems and molecular clusters remain out of reach. Second, they strongly depend on an existing data set. Unfortunately, in chemistry, such God-given data sets are typically not available. Further, it has been shown that generative models of this kind tend to generate molecules that are really quite similar to the ones the model has been trained on. These observations conflict with our initial goal of exploring new areas of chemical space in pursuit of novel compounds. With Molgen, a novel deep reinforcement learning approach, we aim to address this limitation. 
In a nutshell, we propose the first reinforcement learning or RL approach that can build molecular structures in three dimensions. It constructs molecules by iteratively placing atoms in space. Since it's based on quantum chemical principles, it is applicable to any chemical system. Further, Molgen does not suffer from dataset dependence as the RL agent autonomously generates its dataset through strategic exploration by interacting with an environment. In our papers, we show that Molgen can indeed not only build organic and inorganic molecules, but also solvation clusters. With that, I would like to thank my collaborators, my thoughts of funding, and you for your attention. Hello everyone, welcome to my presentation. I am Vivek, a postdoctoral researcher at the Delft University of Technology. I lead the theory and automation research line in the inorganic systems engineering group led by Professor Evgeny Epitko. Uh, we work on data-driven design and discovery of tonicer metal complex-based catalysts. Um, a data-driven high-throughput computational screening workflow can be used to discover amazing catalysts that are located somewhere in the vast chemical space of molecules. Such an approach can immensely benefit from automated, accurate, and rapid methods to predict the um, 3D geometric representation and uh, thermochemical and electronic properties of tonicer metal complexes. The first uh, part of the presentation is about rapid and accurate prediction of a thermochemical property PKA of tonicer metal hydride complexes, wherein we use literature data to build a database of experimental PKA of uh, tonicer metal hydride complexes and we combine density functional uh, tight binding calculations with machine learning approach to predict the experimental PKA and our model performs at uh, par with uh, density functional theory calculations using a hybrid functional. Next, I present ChemSparks, which is a Python based tool to perform automated post functionalization of a given chemical um, scaffold. And we use ChemSparks in conjunction with DFTB calculations and DFT calculations to explore the chemical space of magnet pincer complexes. And we were able to answer some relevant questions with regards to the hydrogenation or dehydrogenation chemistry, such as the choice of base and the linear scaling relation between the free energies of various intermediates. We also explored the quality of geometry generated from ChemSparks against DFT and DFTB calculations. And we also used these geometries to directly predict uh, electronic properties such as uh, um, homoluma gap of magnet pincer complexes. We show that uh, chem sparks can be used on a diverse array of scaffolds, uh, such as a complex molecule case shown here. And I look forward to discussing further with you on my poster, poster number 28. Thank you. Hi, my name is Amol Thacker. I'm a PhD student in the Raymond group at the University of Bern. And today we're going to take you on a journey from the enumeration of chemical space to the assessment of synthetic feasibility using AI. We're going to do this by showing you how we use browser-based tools to facilitate experimentation in the WETS lab. To do this, we focused our approach on a set of 1,323 diamines, enumerated such that they contained up to two rings with ring sizes between five and seven and up to two amines in both exo- and endocyclic conformations. Our primary question becomes how do we select and synthesize the compounds that were generated? To do this, we've applied a template-based retrosynthetic planning tool called AIZINTH Finder, which we developed in collaboration with AstraZeneca. In contrast to previous approaches, we prioritize not only the reactions leading to the desired transformation at each step, but whether they can be applied in silico. This has two key benefits. First, it speeds up the tree search as it negates an additional substructure check. And secondly, it enriches the prioritization due to more information being present in the output vectors. We use this approach to predict multi-step synthesis to the compounds in the diamond database, resulting in roots for 56% of the compounds. We display the database using a T-map, which allows for coloring the space and molecular descriptors and statistics relating to the predicted synthesis routes for each compound. The interface additionally provides links to a database of pre-computed routes for synthetic chemists to examine, such as the one shown here. The key step is a Beckman rearrangement, and routes could not be found with the standard AI's int finder, MIT's ask cause, and IBM reaction. The route shown here was successfully synthesized in the wet lab. We've shown you how we use AI-based synthesis planning to facilitate en experimental engagement in the wet lab. Thank you for listening and looking forward to our discussions. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to my short talk. I'm Moritz Walthoff from the Sheffield Chemoinformatics Group. 
And my poster is about imputation models and also about interpretability of DNN models. I'd like to start with a brief introduction to imputation. And yeah, so basically imputation means filling gaps in a sparse data set. And yeah, related to uh, toxicity data, that means we have like here a couple of uh, toxicity assays, like here the columns of this table, and then uh, a set of compounds. And yeah, compounds have been measured in some of the assays, but not in all of them. And the gray cells here indicate missing data. And then the aim is to fill these gaps with a model. And yeah, the difference to a standard QSA model really is that in a QSA model for test compounds, we only have chemical descriptors available. Um, but yeah, with an imputation model, a test compound may have been uh, tested already in uh, some of the toxicity assays, and we can use this additional uh, information in the model. And yeah, just to give you an overview of what is included in the poster, so there will be an explanation on how feature net models work, which are one approach for imputation modeling. And yeah, then a comparison of performance scores of uh, user models and imputation models on a data set on AIMS mutagenicity, and then also some illustration on an approach for interpreting DNN models that I'm currently also working on. Um, yeah, then I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have about the poster later. Dear colleagues, I am very excited to present you my work, which you can see on the screen. Such approach allows rapidly define the manufacturer of the unknown sample of mineral filterizer and draw a conclusion on a single concept of quality, a standardness of physical and chemical properties of the object. The identification will help to recognize counterfeit products and defective mineral filterizer in the sales markets. The energy dispersive X-ray fluorescence method was used for analysis. The essence of the proposed approach is to compare the spectra of a known sample with the previously built database of quality products of known manufacturers. For each sample, the spectrum was recorded and each of 3000 energy channels of the spectrum was used as separate features. Values of feature are normalized by mean and dispersion. Then the two principal components were calculated and come in clusters were built. Each cluster corresponds to a well-known brand and manufacturer of the filterizer. Furthermore, the chi-square criterion and the average of Euclidean distance inside each cluster were calculated. Based on the combination of these parameters, a conclusion is made about the manufacturer and quality of the filterizers as numerical feature. We use a set of five different filterizers brands and four encrypted samples for experimental validation of the model. As the results, the brands, of the, the brands of all encrypted samples were defined correctly and the numerical quality criterion were calculated. The analysis time of one sample did not exceed five minutes. Thank you for the attention. Hello everyone, I am Shivam Vishnoi and my research interest is all about developing the computer codes and processes that are fast and detailed enough to provide with predictive models to guide synthesis of novel peptide-based drug substances. Across atmospheric to cold screening scales of modeling from nano to microseconds, we do a high throughput screening with peptide libraries using classical MD simulation approach to predict the binding affinities and then in order to characterize the peptide ligand dependent conformational transition during the activation of this GPCR, we employed the unsupervised machine learning based Markov state modeling approach to make reliable predictions. Basically, our model data provides insights into the thermodynamics and kinetic features of binding of known and designed peptide to GPCR and provide rules towards the development of an effective new dual peptide-based API formulation. So the overall abstract is how machine learning can assess the interpretation of classical molecular dynamic simulations. Here we demonstrate how class VGPCR activation kinetics can be studied 
in atomic detail by combining molecular dynamic simulation with Markov state modeling. The overall idea here is to provide with an integrative approach and workflow for the predictive modeling of long time scale dynamics of GPCR system using machine learning based modeling to analyze physics based simulation. For more information, please check post number P37.